Hi, this is Ed in San Diego, and this is a very special day today. It's 11 June, and we're going to be storytelling. And I'm going to contribute, but my job is to moderate and to bring everybody together and be comfortable together. And with us will be a number of people as at least uh, half at least a half dozen and could be two dozen i'm not sure there's a lot of people who have contacted me and said they're interested we'll see what happens today um in my upper left is rob pianka who was on our show about what a year ago a year and a half welcome yeah. rob thank you thank you for having me again ed nice to see you yeah so rob has is a consultant uh, preeminent consultants on global agility yeah. rob why don't you introduce yourself a little bit better than i just did <laughs> rob, rob pianca and uh, uh i have a, a training protocol that you might describe as uh, militantly transcultural <laughs> i'm tired of all listen everybody fight about stuff that you know uh misperceives the people that they're talking about or perceives them too narrowly. So let me ask you about covalence. Did, now, did I say that right? What? Yes, covalence. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Covalence means what? It's a a term in like atomic science where you have a uh, an atom that has uh, molecules of you know electrons that float around and need to bond with something, right? And if you have the right, if you're covalent. Uh, you will uh, approach another material and bond with it. Or organic uh, materials, are, are carbon, are very highly covalent. Gold, which is pure on the other hand, doesn't really bond with anything, right? And it's a human, uh, uh, what's better for a human, to be able to bond with other people or not? Yeah, well. So covalence then, is the quality yeah. of being able to meet somebody in, in, uh, from any culture and bond with them. Well, we're going to learn from you today. That's for sure. <laughs> so, uh, so you say there's about 3000 different, uh, categories out there of people. <laughs> yeah, there's huge numbers. Yeah. You say culture, you're saying a lot of different things and you have to be specific. Usually for our conversations, we end up talking about national cultures, which frankly don't exist. Um, there's so many more cultures that uh, you can just walk out your door and engage in multiculturalism without having to go to another country to do it. Yeah. Okay. So it's um, agility, global-agility.com. Is that correct? That's right. Yeah. Okay, everybody. Uh, use the chat. Introduce yourselves. Uh, to, before I forget to say that again. And um, the, the idea is to network. Uh, I'm going to do the honors of uh, brief introductions, and then I'm going to ask each person to uh, go a little deeper about themselves. Kim Congdon, wonderful to see you again. Thank you for being there, and thanks for sending me all that good information. Do you have that in a slide you would like to put up? Uh, not now, but uh, as we get going. Okay, I I do. Okay, well, get it ready, but don't do it just yet. I will allow screen share. So for you know, those of you who have something to show and display, this is global PR. And you don't do it here. You'll never be able to do it anywhere. <laughs> so uh, somebody's sending me uh, an AI thing here, and they want to enter the waiting room. Okay, who is that who's doing that before I admit it? So let me know, okay? Okay, with us from London, Heather, uh, De Cruz, Cormier. I'm sure I'm not saying that right. I'm not reading it correctly. Heather, I'm sorry for butchering your name. Please do a better job. Didn't De Cruz, Cormier. De Cruz is Portuguese and Cormier is French. And I didn't want to take my husband's French name because I don't. my French isn't that great. So it was more of a kind of identity thing when I got married. <laughs> Um, and then I've struggled with it ever since, especially on my passport. So <laughs> you're not the only one. Anyway, it's lovely to be here, Rob, your newcomer. I don't recognize you. I'm really looking forward to hearing more about your work. Um, Joseph, my dear friend from across the little sea there. Hello there. 
And Stephen, you're looking as brown as a button. I almost didn't recognize you there. So uh, you've obviously had a lovely vacation. And Paul, it's lovely to see you. <laughs> Ali, you're new. And um, Kim, I recognize you from a previous session. So anyway, I'm Heather. As you can see, I'm quite talkative. Um, I'm in London. I'm a business and a coaching psychologist. And I recently completed a research study called Peace of Mind on the Move, which was a whole year of my life. And I've just last week won an award at the Relocate Global Awards for Best Research. And I came ahead of people like Santa Fe that have won it for the past four years, Crown Mobility, who were the favourites. Um, and um, the head judge was is a professor at London Metropolitan University, and she's approached me to get it published in an IHRM journal. Um, so I am feeling at the moment extremely proud and happy with the achievements of my research, not just the insights and trying to get it to change policy, but with the rigor and robustness of the, all of the blood, sweat and tears that I put into it. So I'm very happy. So that's quite a story. Thank you for yeah. telling. <laughs> so I also want to say that Heather and I did a wonderful one on one talk show interview, and it's available free to all of you. And we'll make sure you get it. Let's move on. Uh, in Southern California with me, we have Dr. Ken Lloyd and also Christian Turnedin and also Paul Falcone. Uh, thanks, guys, for being here with me again. Hello, Paul. Oh, you, I can't believe that you're on mute. You have a beautiful voice, so you have to put yourself out there. <laughs> oh. Paul, you're on mute. Yeah. Okay, you'll be back. Okay, Ali Shami and Stephen Howard, uh, welcome to the show. You are uh, the co-authors of a hot new book, Just Out, and it's geared for people who are not Americans. Uh, is that right, Ali? That That's right. Good morning, everybody. It's good to see everyone. It's nice. I see familiar faces and... Uh, so it's glad to be here. I tell you, I'm I'm still I'm still in the thrill mode of finishing the book, working with Stephen. Um, I really really enjoy doing doing the work, and so the book is tailored towards directly for non-Americans. You look at in the market, there's a lot of books on, uh, won't say teaching, but guiding Americans to do business internationally, doing business in Singapore, doing business in Japan. This one, and I saw I saw less and less literature and books on the other way around. Um, so this book fills a gap where it teaches executives, starter companies uh, to do business in the United States. Uh, like um, um, I mentioned earlier that there's no culture, there's, there's so many different cultures and there's no right or wrong, there's right and left. There's not necessarily one culture is better than the other, but it's always communication and relationship to work both ways. Uh, so for companies to be successful, this book will be excellent. So um, it was a great, great experience working with Stephen. Stephen, what can you add to Ali's comments? Not a lot. <laughs> Just like the book, he did most of the work and I added very little. <laughs> no, I added uh, no, I... <laughs> But yeah, so for those who aren't familiar with it, the book is called uh, Partnering Successfully with American Firms. <clears throat> Okay, yeah. Stephen, take the opportunity to uh, use my shared screen, and why don't you show that cover again? Okay, I can do that, I think. There All we go. Right. <clears throat> okay. There we go. <clears throat> so okay. there it is. And yeah. um, the probably one of the most interesting things about the book, or hopefully the readers will find most interesting, is at the back of the book, we uh, included over 100 American idioms. Uh, which are very confusing to non-Americans, things like throw somebody under the bus or, you know, sports terms, Monday morning quarterback or um, nervous Nelly and things of that. So uh, hopefully it'll be a bit educational for our non-American colleagues. Okay, so we're going to come back to you uh, and Ali uh, in just a few minutes. Joseph, my friend, thank you for joining us. And I see your book, cover in the background there, face facts. And uh, your your job is uh, primarily, and please correct me when I stop talking, <laughs> is a uh, reading 
reading a book uh, by looking at someone's face, <laughs> but it's supposed to tell you a lot. And but there are tricks. And so t go a little bit deeper, please, about yourself. Tell us a story about what you do. Well, if I could digress a little, Ed, uh, thank you so much for your glowing welcome. Great to see so many uh, delightful and friendly, familiar faces again. Um, if I can just digress, just listening to Rob uh, reminded me of a story um, going back pretty much 100 years now, the world of, uh, of uh, physics. And uh, when uh, quantum, quantum mechanics, as it was then, came, came to the fore, and there, were, there was a great deal of dissension in the world of physics, and uh, there were the, the classical physicists and the, the people behind, the people promoting mechanic, uh, quantum mechanics, primarily Niels Bohr, Werner Heisenberg, Max Born. And Erwin Schrödinger was one of the people who was diametrically opposed to this, this new arrival. And um, that's where the, 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 the Schrödinger's cat thought equation came from. Um, but he was visiting Niels Bohr in, in Denmark and um, he was very, very ill. So he, he, he took to the bed and Niels Bohr was feeding him soup in the bed and at the same time arguing vehemently against him. So to me, it's just one of those wonderful examples of cross-cultural <laughs> non-integration of cultural viewpoints. Um, and it's, it's one of those things that fascinates me. In terms of why I do what I do, it's really about communication. It's not about delving into people's secrets or doing anything psychic or anything like that. It's really all about communication. It's all about relationships. And particularly now where the world is becoming increasingly influenced by AI and, and digitization, human communication, inter interpersonal communication has never been more vital. And we're, we have a, really, we have a pandemic of loneliness in the world now. So what I'm about is really helping people connect. Well, we, we welcome people into this global meeting room, as I call it, and uh, to share ideas and to become friends, uh, build rapport first, and then perhaps friendship, perhaps trust, and who knows what comes next. Joseph, I invite you to put the book cover on a screen share. Uh, my, my thing is ready for you if you would like to display uh your cover your book cover because it's really fascinating i love it and uh my job is to help promote what you do so okay, if you can... i'm not sure that i have it on a slide ed oh, so okay. bear with me bear with me if it i may have time to create it as we go but okay good thank you for the opportunity all right well we'll get right back to you i'll just raise your hand when you're ready paul falcone can you hear me oh but I, I can, can, and I think you can hear me now. Oh, yes. All Sorry. right. Sorry Loud and clear. That. Welcome. Welcome, Paul. Thank you. Thank you. Nice to be here, everybody. Sorry about that. I had a little problem with my microphone earlier. Yeah, it's hard to believe you would ever have that problem, but... <laughs> <laughs> yes, I you know, I am known for talking a lot, so sorry about that. That was good. good. Okay, so you've got at least one new book out. Do, do you want to share my screen with a, a, a picture of that uh, front cover? <laughs> Well, you know, it's interesting, Ed. I don't have a picture of the cover right now, but what okay. I do have, just so you know, you guys, and since we're talking about communication, I switch gears a little bit. So my book, The 101 Tough Conversations to Have with Employees, I'm happy to say, if you can see it right here. Yes. Uh, number one bestseller this morning on Amazon. So it's cool. Yeah. It, 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 it's not, thank you, Kim. I know. I'm a lucky man. And um, <clears throat> excuse me, the, the idea for me, everybody, is my background was international. I was head of international human resources for Paramount Pictures. And Stephen, what you were saying before about the idioms um, is really important. It's really getting the language to where it needs to be so that people can hear what you're saying. And so many times in English, we talk past these things. And we just assume when you say you hit something out of the park, that people globally are going to understand what that, meta that baseball metaphor is going to mean. And it doesn't. And so raising the awareness of the language that we speak becomes really, really critical. One of the books that I'd written called 2600 Phrases for Effective Performance Reviews actually is ranked number one. I forget what the vertical was, what the category is within um, Amazon, but it was about, you know, teaching business English to foreigners. It's the same type of thing, but I, I'm all there for, for, for you guys when it comes to 
It's the language we speak. It's how you say it. It's not what you're saying. It's how you say it. And raising that awareness makes such a big difference. So thanks for letting me share, Ed. Oh, this is great. Thank you very much. So I want to be sure you all know Dr. Natalie Forrest. Welcome, Natalie. Hi. I think I know just about everybody. Okay. We we have a couple of new people here. Have you met Christian? Uh, no, I don't think I've met Christian or the beautiful lady in green. Yes, uh, I haven't met her either. Is this Attica? Yes? Uh, you're on mute. Um, are you talking about me? Yeah. Yeah. Hi, I'm Johanna from Sweden. Ah. <laughs> it's lovely to meet you all. Oh, um, thank you. Thank you for coming. Thanks. Great. I I didn't see your name on the uh, on the on the and uh, on on the entry label, so that's why. Okay. Uh, um, and the picture is a little blurry. And, is it blurry? Uh, yeah, just a little bit. So um, we're going to go around and get everybody talking in just a minute. So Dr. Natalie and I have known each other uh, almost ten years. I think um, we met in the Washington D.C. area when she was live and in person uh, in the U.S., and now she's uh, back in Hamburg uh, and uh, very, very active in the world of uh, self-help or helpfulness. And you you have given me help for sure, but your specialty <laughs> is women. And so why don't you uh, self-intro yourself uh, here now? Okay, well, thank you, Ed. I think some of you know me or may, might remember me. So Dr. Natalie Forrest, I'm a spiritual life coach, or I prefer mentor. And um, I work on returning, helping to return people to their essence, self-love, um, confidence. And in addition to that, I help run a few companies and uh, communities and organizations um, such as 90210 Enterprise. And of course, Joseph is also uh, a part of that. Um, and also here in Europe, Depeche and Voice Aid. Uh, those are organizations that work on social issues and particularly uh, sustainability. Um, that's what I do. But most of all, I love talking to people and seeing how I can help them to really bring out the best in them. So that's sort of the brief introduction to me. Um, other than that, yes, Ed and I know I've known each other for about 10 years while I was still living in the U.S. and I just recently uh, uh, returned home. Yeah, so how's your daughter doing? Uh, she's good and she's now 13. So we'll, <laughs> we'll see how that goes. <laughs> Well, here, she's here. actually a joy. So, I'm not oh, that's great. So, so she's uh, so is she into counseling like like you are? Uh, no, she's more into performing arts. <laughs> well, but she's I... also the counselor for all her friends. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's fun. Okay, so uh, my friend Christian is originally from uh, Germany and and uh -huh. and Switzerland. Uh, the uh, German part of of Switzerland, right? So he's now in Southern California and a long term um, uh, executive within relocation management companies, talent mobility. Mm -hmm. um, so I want you to meet Johanna, uh, who's going to um, she's from uh, Sweden, and uh, she's advising me on my first Scandinavia in-person meeting, which will be produced in person in Malmo, Sweden, on uh, September 26th at the Quality View Hotel Conference Center. And uh, I was introduced to Eva Klevis, who's an HR uh, senior manager in Malmo, by Dr. Natalie. And so the world keeps spinning around Ooh. here of who knows who and making connections and then not screwing it up. So we get to build things. <laughs> okay. So Paul Falcone, um, it's just amazing that you wrote those two books that you showed 
uh, that you talked about, you wrote them years ago and that they're still being read. So that means there's a new generation of readers. Well, well, the publisher does ask for updates, Ed. So yeah, it, but you know, so you're updating, normally when they do an update for, for a book, a new edition, it's 20% new content. That's kind of the general rule I use. But there's so much going on out there, especially in this post-COVID world that we're in. Um, yeah, there's a lot of new scenarios. There's a lot of new speaking points, I think, that we have to address. And even, Ed, to the point of the Gen Z, the Zoomers, the 25 and under crowd, consistently testing out as the most you know isolated, lonely, and depressed generation on the planet. I mean, there's a lot going on that we have to keep an eye on. And the reason why employee wellness is so big these days is because of the, you know, the Gen Z, the younger cohort. So um, these are all parts of what the new reality is as we emerge from this uh, pandemic and move into this new reintegration phase. Fascinating. Dr. Ken Lloyd um, has been um, a counselor and a, and a writer uh, and a coach and and a speaker uh, for for many years, and uh, I want you to uh, meet um, and talk with everybody on this program uh, and and bring your perspective. Uh, so Rob Pianka uh, and I uh, did a couple of talk shows uh, going back a year, 18 months ago, uh, about agility. Uh, and uh, on an internet, intercultural international basis. Uh, and I'm going to summarize and just tell me if I get it wrong, okay? I have thick skin. <laughs> so, no, it's always, it's always okay. So your thing is getting beneath the skin uh, of culture is cross-cultural and understanding people uh, to make uh, the relationship actually fruitful and not surface. Is that correct? For me, it is, yes. Yeah, okay. And so the... Um, the DISC, the, the DISC uh, training program that you've incorporated, uh, how is that aiding your pursuit? Um, it helps that a lot of people know DISC, that the DISC that I'm working with is different uh, in the sense that it focuses on um, cultural dimensions in a um, a modern way that understands them better. You know, we, we inherit a lot of concepts and we're in a world that is radically different and it's hard to know when you should let something go. And uh, then what do you, what do you dive into? What, what's, what's new and credible? And you even reach a point where, you know, there's nothing precedent can help us with in certain circumstances that are so different for everybody. Uh, and then what I say is you have to go back to first principles. You have to start thinking for yourself and then, you know, close your eyes and uh, don't focus on something that you see in somebody that makes it so easy to categorize them that your work is done, you know, just slowly, uh, especially avoid those things, you know, go around go around the side and, and find something that uh, you have in common with the person and, and try to build that rapport so that you can take on these issues. Cause we're really not prepared to be, eyeball to eyeball as we are right now um, so that... good thank you very much kim condon a uh, longtime uh, hr executive transformative person in in industry over the years uh, with diverse background which in, includes entertainment industry as as well as uh what fortune 100 uh you know yeah. So now, now you're in your own business and P3, um, people, performance, and profits. Yeah, thanks, Ed. Uh, yes, yeah. um, I am. And so the whole idea is focus on people and their performance and profitability, you know, will grow, will be enhanced because having been in the business for a long time, uh, that's what happens and people try to get around it but in the end 
if you're looking for you know long term growth and sustainability of a company, that's that's the heart of it. And I I sent you a note that I just started partnering um, with a group called Pro Partners Group, and actually I can share my screen. Yeah, why don't you do that? That's P R O B E. Yep. Probing yeah. meaning learning more about talent. Exactly. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So talent assessment, onboarding, exactly. training, development. Yep. Yep. Let me see if I can get this going. Okay. So that's an LA firm? It is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you do global stuff? Um. Absolutely. I mean, the companies that we're working with, some of them are indeed global. And okay. Okay. Here, we, here we go. There we go. So, um, yes. I, anyways. All right, so this is, it's called Pro Partners. And then what it is, is that there's someone that I've known for a number of years, and he decided last year to go out on his own. He was with Corn Ferry as a search partner. Um, and so he approached me, I don't know, several months ago um, and asked for my advice on building his business. And what is unique about his business is on the, on the talent side is that we helped him pull together a talent advisory group in all different kinds of disciplines. So when he is doing a search and let's say he's looking for uh, a manufacturing person, one of the people that'll be included in that search is someone from the advisory board that is a you know executive in, in manufacturing, for example. So just, you know, a really a big value add from that standpoint. And, and so I've always been impressed with his innovation and his creativity. And then, um, you know, I was talking about what I've been working on, which is of course the, the P3 of it, the human capital advisory side, and I have a little uh, slide there that talks about that, that we're putting, you know, the people at the heart of everything. And he's like, you know, Kim, I would love it if I had a more a, a broader offering and I, I love what you do and you know I've known you for a long time. Would you like to partner? So that's that's what we're doing now. So now we're still offering the executive search, which he focuses on and his team, and then and then also adding in you know, the leadership development, the team performance, the organizational development, and organizational assessments. And really the whole idea in terms of, you mentioned transformative, is you know, looking to transform the organization, transform the culture, or retain what's really, really critical to the culture in order to increase the effectiveness of the organization. So that's what I'm doing. Oh, it's, thank you for sharing that information. That's very helpful. Once again, everybody, share your information with each other using the chat. Uh, because you, there's a lot going on here today and a limited time. And so the follow-up is your ROI for sure. Heather, uh, the research report you did was tied in with the Permits Foundation, and that has to do with, and please correct me if I step out of bounds here, uh, dual career situations. Is that correct? Yeah, I'm just uploading a picture of my storyboard. I don't know if everyone can see oh, it. If yeah, there we see. go. Yeah, yeah so this is, this is a little bit like an academic storyboard, but I bring this when I'm doing panels and things like that. Um, yes, thank you very much, everyone. It's lovely to meet you all today. So I'm a business and coaching psychologist, and I'm in the global mobility sector. And I recently conducted a study called Peace of Mind on the Move. And... Um, I was commissioned by my client called REA and it had 34 participants from around the globe and was multi-generational as well as multicultural. Um, and our, I think our remit today is to talk about coaching and stories. And I asked Ed if I could talk about coaching and stories in research because 
capturing the successful benefits of research, I think I'm sure Stephen and Paul will, will know this too, especially with leadership. You know, let's look at the, the cost benefit ratio of training, for instance, one of the first things I did in my career. Um, everyone feels very motivated, everybody loves training. And what happens to this motivation curve four weeks later when everyone's kind of forgotten what it was, the theories that they learned and what it was that they're supposed to be changing their behaviors on. And the support that we give, for instance, in global mobility and the spousal support in the dual career sector is something that permits foundation and is very dear to my heart, have created a huge body of evidence on. And they've actually shown statistically that the role of the partner and the spouse and dual careers continues to be one of the most critical factors in the success of an overseas assignment. Um, and I find this marvelously interesting because I actually did give up my career to travel with my husband 20 years ago and I became unemployed whilst he was promoted. So there is a real, um, you know, there is a real kind of core experience at the heart of that. So having been in the coaching arena for many years, I really wanted to move into, um, into the thought leadership side of advocacy for permits and how can we prove, how can we access these stories on assignment and make them relevant so that HR policy and GM policy becomes intelligent enough to keep investing in this wonderful benefit that does have ROI, but we keep having the same conversations again and again. So this research that I designed, um, you know, three of the key insights were human connection is the first hidden missing link that emerged. Now, that was not in any of the statistical quantitative big data that I looked at from McKinsey and all of the great big providers and drivers of meta analysis and all of these things. Um, but health and well-being was and resilience was, and this is post-pandemic when we all saw how important those key workforce trends are, especially with the remote working and hybrid working. And of course, coaching and storytelling is changing as our workplace transforms as well. So that's just a little bit about me, a little bit about the coaching, a little bit about the research and storytelling and how we can capture those experiences and those stories, but make them compelling for data and make them measurable. And I tried to do that. I hope I did that. Um, and I did win an award last week in my first Global Mobility Award for Best Research Contribution. Um, and I'm absolutely over the moon. I can't tell you how excited I am. Um, because it's finally gaining traction. So, yeah, that's it. So is there a database, uh, uh, talking about dual career situations, is there a database, Heather, of the um, um, partner spouse skills? Uh, is there a sharing uh, of getting these people jobs? Uh, or what's the next step with this? Yeah, well, let, so um, Christian Christian will be very well informed in this as well um, because of the work that he's done. Um, but there is, so some companies have been very innovative in setting up dual career networks. Christian will know there's a very, very, that there's the dual career network, which is kind of housed in Switzerland. It's kind of groundbreaking. And what happens is, is that the big multinational companies um, sign up to it and then there's a chamber of commerce that then also takes part and what happens is is the idea is is that when there is a vacancy it's offered to the dual career community first that's how it should work and then you have recruiters signing up in the local market and executive search companies signing up and they work with those companies in order to try and find suitable employment for the spouse but it's quite expensive, um, you know, it's a sponsor, um, it's, it's sponsor initiated. And then, but it is, I must admit, it, it gives the opportunity, first of all, to the spouse, but then you have a lot of compliance issues and you have a lot of issues around immigration because a lot of countries are very protective around finding jobs for their own nationals before the international community should have the opportunity to work so i know you will all be aware of some of these issues um but the permits foundation what they do is they advocate and lobby around the world 
in country so that the expatriate who gets a work visa, there is a dependent visa attached to that, which goes to a highly qualified spouse and allows that spouse to work for the time that the assignee is working. So it's dependent upon the assignee and it is issued by the same company. And this is what the Permits Foundation has fought for over the past two decades. And they've um, managed to secure those same rights and equality rights. And, you, you know, we had a, a conference last week and they were talking about it as a basic right to work within your family. Um, and they've managed to secure those permits in over 35 countries over two decades. You know, America is also one of the countries that um, that, that allows this as well. Um, but there have been a lot of problems with supply chain and delays and, you know, especially post pandemic. But the you know, the 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 ground, the ground premise is there that many, many countries want to do this. But then in the emerging markets and, you know, the BRIC uh, countries, they're not really signed up to it um, because they have other issues going on. Um, but what it means is, is that dual career families and dual income families then only have one income if the spouse can't work. And then there may be a failed assignment, which can cost up to one point five million dollars if the company has invested in the talent to send the family abroad and then it doesn't work out. So there is a real ROI here. There are real issues here, real challenges here. Um, but it's it's looking hopeful and, and we have a lot of optimism here. Well, thank you for sharing your slide. Um, if you could take that down now, yep, that would I be have. good because it uses a lot of megabytes. I'm finding <laughs> that, but it's really helpful information. So thank you for sharing. And um, I, I, I'm going to, as I mentioned earlier, I'm going to send around the the video um, interview that Heather and I did. It, it's been around the world at least twice now. <laughs> and I mean, I mean, literally thousands of eyeballs have been on it over the past uh, few months. And so I'm really proud to have that. Okay, so Rob Pianka, what do you think of what, what Heather was just talking about from a cultural agility it's, point of it's, view? It, it's a, beyond my competence. It's a, <laughs> I compliment you. Um, oh, that the dog likes it. Too. Yeah. I don't necessarily uh, work with uh, corporations or companies. I, I um, in the uh, in the human march towards you know uh, the, the future, they're in the lead. Uh, they don't have anywhere near the problems that everybody else has in this tra in the transformational era that we live in. And so I I typically go back to people who have no chance of working for corporate such corporations um, in terms of the what cultural competences need to be promoted. Um, you know, we live in, a, in, a, in an era where you can't propose good policy on an international level or on a national level because the people have no, under, no understanding. Um, and that's let people run away with policy. And there's very little connection between, um, you know, your, your, your workers, your consumers, your uh, uh, people on the margins of economies and the corporate sector nationally or globally. And it's one of the main problems. Um, uh, I have a, this, this enduring belief that uh, uh, common sense things, and I was, I was, when I was listening to you, I was thinking, of course it should be that people can, who are someplace, you know, should contribute. This whole idea that uh, human capital, if you want to call people human capital, uh, is then uh, a narrows as opposed to a widening of opportunity and experience is, is uh, uh, not tenable. You know, uh, I don't, <laughs> as this is not a comment on the stuff that you do, it's just a comment on, on, on the sector of priority that I, that I have. Um, Great, thank you. Yeah. This is Idea Exchange 101, so uh, everything goes. Let's go to uh, Ali, Shami, and Stephen Howard and this new book. Um, so, uh, 
I don't see, was it yesterday or the day before when you were saying that it took you about 18 months to go from start to, to now? Stephen? Yeah, it was about 18 months. Um, uh, you know, Ollie retired from the Boeing company and because he was such a good manager there, they kept bringing him back into se several gigs. So that kind of, it took us a bit longer than our original expectations. Uh, but uh, yeah, we uh, actually, interestingly, we, we kicked the book off by meeting in Palm Spring or Palm Desert, California for a weekend and really nutted the whole book out. Um, but uh, for those of you who um, <clears throat> know about Ed's networking, uh, Ollie and I met on one of these shows uh, through Ed, I think twice, and then Ollie reached out to me and said, because I help other authors publish their books, and Ollie reached out to me and said, hey, I want to talk to you about writing a book, and I got on the phone with them, and I said, yeah, I can help you do this, I can show you how to outline it, I can help, but and I probably talked for seven or eight minutes, so all the things I could do to help him write his book, and he goes, no, no, you misunderstood, I want to write a book with you, <laughs> and so then we had to start the conversation all over again. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So there's a story for you, Ed. So there's storytelling. So I can tell you all things about why it took 18 months, but there's a story as to how it all came together. So Ali, um, yeah. how do you like being pulled back in? Like in The Godfather, and Michael was complaining uh, that they pulled me back in, you know? Yeah, it, it, it feels great. It's not just that. I mean, I would probably, uh, I, I don't want... I don't want any the company to know that I would do it for free, but it's just I miss the people, I miss the culture, I missed having you know helping the new rising stars, new leaders. Uh, so uh, so it feels great. I'm enjoying it. Unfortunately, it slowed down getting the book out, and thanks to Stephen, he was very patient and very encouraging to uh, uh, to continue doing that. Um, I intentionally was looking for somebody like Stephen, a leader like Stephen, because um, like I mentioned earlier, if you look in the in the literature, there isn't that many teaching um, or helping international leaders to do business in the United States. Uh, for some reason, we think like Hollywood is doing such a great job. Everybody knows about what America is all about. Um, I've lived, I was born and raised in, in Lebanon. I uh, watched... Uh, all the all the TV shows, chips, um, all you know everything. But but it's like probably like five years, a little bit older, you know. Just um, uh, but but I went through. But I understood America just based on the movies, on the TVs, on the uh, and and based on Hollywood, what Hollywood present and what Fox News and CNN and and everything. But just for companies, for international leaders to excel in the uh, partnering with Americans, they got to really understand the uh, the uh, individual culture, the national culture, geography, the, the uh, regional culture, all of those are very important. So so to me, uh, Stephen was just a perfect um, <clears throat> leader to, uh, to partner with because he's lived most of his uh, uh, life outside the United States as an American. I've lived in the United States after I moved from Lebanon. So it was a really great way. Where if you look at the stories, talking about stories in the book, there's a lot of stories about things that happens, idioms during in a meeting and a very important meeting. And um, so um, so it's really, yeah, it's, it's stories. I, what I've heard earlier, just like it really resonated with me. Um, it goes back to that connection with human beings, right? Just relationships. Uh, the best thing that any company can do for their new employees is to show them how they treat their experienced employees. You know, we've heard about the best thing you can do for your children is treat their treat your spouse well. But companies, a lot of focus right now, we want to attract, we want to retain the new employees. And you'll see a lot of companies are focusing more on let's treat, let's keep these new employees coming in. We want to take them. We want to bring in talent. And for a lot of times, they forget about the mid-careers and the experienced employees. So, so when I see it, just we share. If you just give me one second, I want to share one story uh, that happened. We had one. We had an engineer who's been thirty-five years in the in the uh, 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 at work, and he retired. Part of the best practice that we do is all the leaders in the building in the bay. Week we, we uh, at four p.m. right before the person 
leaves. So Alex, and this time he was, that's his last day for retirement. We all gather around in his office and we walk him to the door. And when Alex was walking, he had a small box in his hand. Like it was not small, but it was, it was, and he's just carrying it outside the office, going to the car to give his badge and he's gone. And you can see that he was carrying the box, like carrying his grandson. And as if he's saying, Ali, just tell me, somebody need to ask me what's in this box. So I say, Alex, hey, what's what's in your box? And his, his, his face just lit up and he's like, here's what I have in the box. And guess what was in it? It wasn't, it wasn't the, uh, the, the paychecks throughout the years that he worked for the company. It was all the post-it notes. It was the kudos. It was the thank yous from the customers, from the suppliers, from the people. He looked at me and he looked at the rest and said, that's what's the most important thing. Right away, I looked at a couple of new employees. You could just see how that transmitted, that energy, that power went from Oh, this is how they treat experienced employees. So if there's anything I want to stress that it's missing, I think, I think there's a the focus is not necessarily uh, in the right place. I've seen it in several or, uh, organizations. So thank you for the opportunity to connect me with Stephen. And uh, thank you for the, and I'm learning, I'm learning a lot from everything that I said, that I heard today. So. Well, my friend, I've learned from you over the years, you and I have uh, um, done, uh, I don't know, about 20 Meeting, live meetings together, uh, including uh, one time uh, I produced that event at a restaurant in Seattle and you came with your son yeah. and, and we had as our keynoter uh, Juan Carlos from who's head of uh, talent mobility for Microsoft Corporation and your son videoed that. So how's your son doing? He's in college he's now, right? Well, I succeeded in bringing him to the company and, uh, uh, and yeah. he graduated. Yeah, he graduated and he's like expensive. The Seattle, the houses are so expensive. I'm like, look, in the Lebanese culture, we wait when they, we don't just wait until they're 18 years old and they, they just like go go on their own. I said, here, I have a mother-in-law apartment. Why don't you just go live there? And so he's living there with his girlfriend. So he's, he's doing very well. He was very excited for giving that opportunity to put that video together. And, and uh, um, so, uh, so thank you. Oh, thank you very much. That, and that was a, a nice restaurant that uh, we were in. I forget what it was called, but the, the fish was great. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I thank you for your indulgence with me over the years. Uh, thank you. I was in San Francisco and uh, Canada. Seattle, yeah, Canada and Seattle. It was wonderful. Okay, let's move on and talk with Joanna, may I ask you to say hello and introduce yourself um, and what your what your work is? Yeah, uh, I would love to. Hi, everyone. So I'm still pretty new to your show, Ed. Uh, we are communicating over LinkedIn, I think, but we will meet in September. Uh, and I'm actually down in Malmö now, Ed. Uh, so I am from Stockholm. Um, but I've lived abroad uh, for many, many years, and I hear all these places, Seattle. I was a student in Seattle. Uh, I hear Heather talk about being, you know, a, a, an accompanying spouse. I was there. Uh, I was fortunate enough uh, to meet uh, a very professional um, senior person who sponsored my work visa in Mexico City, so I could also work while my husband was working. Uh, and that's sort of how I changed career as well after those years, relocating back home to Sweden after so many years abroad, three kids born abroad. Um, I went into global mobility uh, because I've lived and experienced everything, um, challenging housing markets, um, difficulties with the visa process, um, different cultures, um, just, you know, I've experienced it all and it has just, you know, transformed into such a neat profession for me. And also my little thing uh, as part of storytelling is that now I recruit uh, expat spouses because it's so difficult for um, someone coming, joining, you know, family to find a job. 
um, the person with a job, you know, everything is easy. Um, everyone loves, you know, that they come and, and do this work, but um, then the one who is following who maybe would like to work, uh, it's difficult for that person. So that's my thing now. And um, I, I think it's like the best recruitments I have ever had are, are these um, spouses uh, to expats because all they want to do often is work and they just love to jump on an opportunity. Uh, so, so that's, um, that's my story. <laughs> well, that's really interesting. And I want you it to is. please connect uh, with the chat with Heather mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. of course, everybody. And, uh, and I'll, I'll leave that to you guys. So, um, yeah. the meeting in Scandinavia will be in yes. Malmo on yes. September 26. Mm -hmm. And uh, thank you so much for your interest to help me advise me and introduce me around and I'll take it from there. Um, now we're going to focus in on, on content development for September 26, which mm -hmm. will be set up like a workshop. And uh, we'll, we'll have pod seating uh, for about uh, between 20 and 30 people. And we have some people coming from London and also from Germany and uh, I think Switzerland as well. But are uh, they going to join virtually or are they are going to be on site? Well, it will be both. Uh, we will um, have a, a meet and greet, a reception and a luncheon that will not be virtual. But the workshop, which will be from approximately 1 p.m. to 3 p.m., that will be on global TV. And we will have speakers uh, located outside of Sweden. In fact, very possibly from different locations around the world. So if any of you would like to uh, be involved in this uh, Scandinavian global HR talk show, <laughs> it's going to be September 26. And the, the time will be Central European time uh, between 1 p.m. and 3 p.m. Uh, so keep that in mind for our connectivity. The show will be uh, recorded as uh, across that two hour, and then uh, I'll edit it and then put it out on uh, distribution around the world following the live broadcast. So that's really interesting. So I thank you for your kind interest to, to be involved. Tell us about the company uh, what you're doing. It's it's not mobility, but it's connected to mobility. Yeah, so I, I was um, a mobility manager for many, many years, uh, and I decided I wanted to do something else. And um, I now, since two years back, I work for, or actually less than two years, I work for a Danish company. Uh, it's move in. It's only corporate housing, nothing else. So it's very focused uh, and very niched. So I'm setting, yeah, I've been setting up the company pretty much, building the company. Uh, I just recruited an American lady who has been in Sweden for a year without a job. <laughs> She's super excited. Um, and um, so, yeah, expats or project workers, they can come and stay with us short term, long term. We do our own furniture, so it's a bit different from, you know, your traditional corporate housing. Meaning um, you make your furniture? Yeah, we design and make them. So it's, it's, it's yeah, the, the apartments we have are super branded because it's our own furniture, most of it. So does it look like Ikea? Nope. Nope, much nicer. Good, good. <laughs> I'm actually now in one of them, but yeah. <laughs> you, no, that's I interesting. Will show you. When you're here, when you're here, Ed, I'm going to show you. Oh, I'll be there. And, and Joanne yeah. will be with me. I'm sure she'll be interested because yeah. of her own yes, background exactly. in, yeah. in uh, yeah. corporate lodging. Okay, so that's really interesting. And I have to tell you, just as an aside, I have nothing wrong with IKEA. We, we go in. No, no, uh, no, no. My but, gosh, that's a Swedish company. Nothing yeah, wrong with that. Yeah, at all. No. right, right. And we want them to show up at the meeting. <laughs> But I had a hell of a bad time putting together the furniture. <laughs> and yes. because I, I have yes. thumbs, not fingers, and screwing the things together. And I, I needed help. 
Yeah, that can be tricky. <laughs> but it wasn't just me that is so hard putting it together. Like, yeah. Thank you for that. <laughs> Isn't that, sweets as well. <laughs> isn't that interesting? Uh, Dr. Ken Lloyd, what do you think about all this conversation? It, it just is a little bit different from the past shows. A wonderful conversation. Uh, th I'm thinking so many people in this group to congratulate uh, on your books and on your achievements, uh, Heather, on, on your awards, certainly Paul on your new book, Stephen and Ali, and it's just all of you. And I, I love hearing about this covalence because that's that kind of underlies a lot of what what's going on here. Is that everybody connecting? And uh, you know, it's not gold. It's just as you said. It's not just separate entities. Uh, my specialty is in, in people at work. And as as Paul was talking, a scary thought came into my mind between his book on performance appraisal and mine on performance appraisal. We have around six thousand phrases. That's kind of scary. You know, I could kind of overwhelm the, the, the world with, with phrases. But uh, yeah, I, I met Paul years ago. He's just been a, a great buddy, a, a great resource, and just a wonderful friend over, over these years. And this type of networking that's going on, I see the commonality here. It's not like we're all talking systems and processes and procedures and let, how do we get this to balance. We're talking people, uh, whether it's reading faces as, as Joseph does and has educated us on so beautifully, or you go into the relationships, you go into covalence and all, that's really what leadership, what managing, what success is, is about. Understanding our coworkers, understanding our employees. You know, Paul mentioned the kind of, if you will, the relatively alienated under 25 group and how do, how do we deal with them, not to stereotype them, but to make sure that we're aware of, of what they're experiencing and that certainly applies that whether we're doing work internationally or even across the across the U.S. to be sensitive to different individuals, sensitive to different cultures. So I, I think this is great. And as I've said to you, to you before, Ed, the program is interesting. It's educational. It's informative. It, it's it's really got it all. And that it comes from once again the people. Such an interesting group that's uh, that's put together. And I like this commonality under it. Now I'll tell you a funny story. I was doing a consulting project. I used to go to uh, Scottsdale, Arizona for one day to do an educational program. And uh, my wife always tells me, well, you should wear this, you should wear that. Okay. So she had this checkered shirt that she got for me and tan pants and don't have to wear a tie. So when I got to the hotel in Arizona, it was the exact apparel that the parking valets were wearing. <laughs> the bellboy, bell people were wearing. I was dressed as if I worked in the hotel. So I got there and people are saying, hi, can you take this up? I'm really <laughs> So uh, anyhow, it, it was uh, it was interesting. And next time maybe do a little <laughs> little planning ahead and make sure you know the culture you're walking you're walking into. But I met some very nice people and that's always important to me. That's As really interesting. Today. Nice to meet all, uh, meet and or see all of you today. So, uh, so Paul Falcone introduced me to you uh, in time for you to join our January uh, telecast. Uh, so uh, it's been a great ride just since January having you involved. Yeah, well, and Ed, I'll just add full disclosure. Kim was my boss at Time Warner. <laughs> So just so everyone knows who's who on the pecking order, just throwing it out there. But uh, Kim was the best boss I've ever had. Just so <coughs> there you go. Hey, it's, Kim. Wow. It's so nice to have a fan, and especially a fan as wonderful as Paul, it's for sure. Um, but I had to, you know, I, I had to ask you, Ken, did you get any tips? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the tip was make sure you know what the, the crew is wearing before you go into a seminar. <laughs> that was the tip I walked away with. But great question, Kim. Oh, that's great. So uh, I want you to just know something uh, about me. A uh, long time, I'm from Boston, Massachusetts, originally moved to LA in 1980 after trying to get my act together to relocate uh four years earlier <laughs> and I never did it. I wish I did because I would have benefited from the real estate boom during that period of time, <laughs> but I didn't. But when I was a young man uh, in Boston, uh, I um, 
when I was in the U.S. Army, I was a medic. Uh, I was trained as an operating room technician, and the doctors trained me. Uh, they were all in Harvard Medical School, so I learned what not to do more than, and of course, what to do inside the uh, OR, i.e. emergency room. And that sort of prepared me for a job that I got right after getting out of the uh, Army. Uh, I walked into... Uh, a film company, a Hollywood film company, United Artists, in their Boston office, unannounced, and uh, I dressed, um, and uh, I was overdressed, as it turned out, because it was film business, and people were in jeans even way back then, and um, so it, the guy hired me. <laughs> and I knew nothing about it other than loving movies. So it turned out that that uh, developed into a short career. And um, before I relocated to L.A., I um, had the uh, honor and pleasure, actually, for a while before it got different, <laughs> yeah, um, with a guy by the name of Sumner Redstone, who turned out to be... Uh, uh, a wizard at acquiring companies, including Paramount Pictures and CBS and, and all kinds of other things. And I was the young, youngest person on the executive team, and they wanted my opinion about Woodstock <laughs> and, and other movies that would appeal to uh, kids uh, for booking into the theaters around the country. And so I sat in one day, I'll be real quick here, in the office, they had a screening room, and my job was to watch movies and write a report about them. And would they be good for this theater or that market or age bracket or what? And then maybe some ad lines, because I was into PR and advertising even back then. But uh, so I wrote a report about Woodstock, the movie, and the one I saw was not the finished product. It was a director's cut and uh, real rough footage. Uh, so I, I gave it a, a report saying, uh, the, you know, people over 30 aren't, aren't going to know what it's about and won't want to be involved in a theater when everyone else is smoking dope. So it was uh, that kind of report. And uh, everybody who was older than me on that team said, don't invest any money in buying it. So I went the opposite way and says, this would be great. So they had theaters uh, in different college campuses, including Harvard <laughs> and and Brown and near Columbia and, and other Ivy League schools. And I said, put it in and quick. And so they did, and they made millions of dollars. So I was like a hero for a little bit. Uh, but just to give you the idea, so when I had the opportunity in LA, when I was publishing California Bound Relocation Guide, to run into Paul Falcone, and I guess you were at Paramount or Nickelodeon at the time. I don't, I don't remember. Yeah, I think it was, it was Paramount like at the time, er, sure. Early 80s. So, mm -hmm. and here we are today. <laughs> and and I'm playing Steven Spielberg doing this kind of TV show. <laughs> so thank you, Paul. And because we go way back. <laughs> And, you and me and some the redstone. That's exactly <laughs> right. Yeah. So look what uh, that's turned out to be now. God, it's amazing. I can't believe it's worth so much money, though. I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. It's a lot of a lot of movies. Okay, let's move on um, to um, someone who's not in the entertainment business, and uh, who wants to speak here? <laughs> Stephen. You're in the entertainment business. <laughs> so, but uh, as a leadership coach, uh, is, is that always an entertainment vehicle for you? It's entertaining for me because uh, <laughs> uh, one of the things I love, listening to Ken, Paul, even things Rob talks about, um, they're the same issues we were facing 15 years ago. There are some new issues, which is why books need to be updated and, you know, classroom facilitation needs to be updated but you, you know i'm sure rob would agree there are just so many leaders in today's world who don't understand the historical context of things uh, much less the multicultural aspects of things and so we keep repeating over and over and over um, the same issues um, 
you know, that Paul and Ken write about in terms of feedback and and uh, performance reviews and stuff are things we've been kicking around for a while. But I will share on a positive note a really fast story um, for you guys in the mobility industry, because I'm so impressed with the strides you're making. I was an expatriate uh, in my early 20s, so this goes back decades. And my first assignment in Singapore, I was one of six American expatriates in the same company, <clears throat> Dallas-based global company. And none of the wives, I was single, but the other five were all married and none of their wives could work, couldn't get a work permit. And so the wife of our controller, our financial controller for the region, she and I set up a business where I would go to Korea on a business trip, spend a couple of days. I would buy furniture, Korean handmade furniture, and we would ship it down to Singapore. And of course, like all the women and all the expatriate women in Singapore couldn't work. She had a great network. So we were selling Korean made furniture to all the expatriate families, not all, but many of them uh, from different countries in Singapore. So I uh, just love those strides that everyone's making in, in trying to take care of the spouses of male or female of the expatriates who are moving. So well done. Uh, don't have to go in the furniture business anymore. That's a great story. So my dad was in the furniture business in Boston, but not from Korea. I think just from North Carolina. <laughs> so, so Christian, did you have a follow-up talk with Alex? Not yet. I messaged him and, yeah. and we're waiting to set something up. But since we're talking about furniture, talked about Ikea earlier, um, I wanted to share that uh, we decided, my, my girlfriend at the time and now wife, when we moved from Switzerland in 2000, we wanted to move for good. So that meant uh, renting a 20 foot container, moving with a moving company. And uh, because once you move for good with household goods, uh, moving very little is very costly. And when you fill up the container it gets cheaper and cheaper. And that made us ship our IKEA furniture from Switzerland to the United States. And I can tell you all, if you don't know already, an American Billy and a Swiss Billy from IKEA that's probably made in China go along really, really well. Um, of course, all the measurements are metric, which must be confusing to a lot of Americans, but they look exactly the same and Almost 25 years later, they're still in our living room. So why can't we all just get along like the two Billies? <laughs> That's a great IKEA story. There you go. Thank, thank you for the positiveness. Thank you. <laughs> oh, this is great. Oh, I've had a good time today. Joseph, what are you working on now? I mean, is it some big project or... Uh, not a big project, but if I can do my usual diversing uh, into a, a story, um, Ken reminded me of uh, something in my own history. I Many years ago, it was summer. We do occasionally get summer days in Ireland. It's very occasional, but they do happen. And it was a lovely, <laughs> lovely warm summer's day. I was wearing a Hawaiian shirt and I decided I was going to go for a massage. So when I went for the massage, went into the room, and my shirt was the exact, exact color and match and pattern of the curtains in the room. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, one of those occasions to fade into the background. Um, but it's such a wonderful experience again to have so many people sharing so willingly and so openly from their skill set, their experience and their personality. And it's part of my own experience time and again, when I work with groups, how little people actually now communicate and share. I was doing a, a presenting a training last week to a, a multinational group online. Uh, it was on communication skills and I had a number of breakout rooms. And for one of the breakout rooms, I just asked them to go in and share their highlight of the last 12 months whatever it was and it was entirely up to them what they shared and several people when they came out of the breakout room said that they felt really vulnerable sharing a highlight and that really shocked me because i wasn't asking them to do anything terribly personal 
but the fact that they weren't accustomed to sharing anything of significance was quite shocking to me. And it seems to be replicated in so many circumstances. So I'm simply not working on a master plan or a big project as such, of just redefining how I present because so many people are simply not accustomed to communicating in any meaningful way. They don't make phone calls. They refuse to make phone calls, refuse to take phone calls, and they're missing out on so much. So I'm looking to adapt my approach so that I'm actually helping bring that back into people's lives, their professional lives and their personal lives. Because again, what we're seeing in so many reports, and I'm sure Ken and Paul in particular would be well aware of it, uh, obviously from, from what um, Heather is doing, there are so many issues around trust, respect, autonomy in the workplace now where, where people are, do not feel respected, do not feel heard, do not feel listened to, and feeling is a big part of the communication world. And um, there's so many gaps occurring, and we're reading so much about quiet quitting, presenteeism, and the number of people who are intending to quit is quite astonishing. I came across a statistic recently from, I'm not sure whether it was Gallup or Great Place to Work, that only 9% of people in, in their surveys in the American workplace are content in the workplace. Um, so there's so much that really is should be quite shocking to anybody, any kind of business leader, um, manager, director, owner, but so much of that is just being missed. Kim. Yes, sir. Yeah. What do you have to say about all this now that you're expanding your business reach and it sounds like there's uh, yeah. work work for you to do. There's a lot yeah. of work. Yeah. You know, the thing is, there is a lot of work to do. Um, and one of the things about this group that really stands out is no one's just sitting here just, you know, um, uh, focusing earlier something on the, the process that I think was Ken and you know, the systems and so forth, they're focusing on people and they're doing it in a storytelling way. And I think that's critical. And you know, one of the things that I've found, you know, as I as I work on coaching and, and mentoring and consulting is that you know, opening up, you know, that trust piece, sharing and being uh, vulnerable yourself with your own stories makes such a difference in terms of what people can um, withstand. For one thing, you know, let's say it's a coaching situation and the person is is struggling. You're just talking about what their challenges are is really painful. Um, and if, especially if you're talking to, you know, a CEO or someone else really senior who's just not very comfortable with getting negative feedback. But once you share with them a story, whether it's about yourself or someone else that you've helped, like for example, there's this one leader that I worked with um, that, you know, he was so, so strong and so, so smart, but you know, like all of us, he had some development areas and then he went on to become you know, CEO of a, a well-known entertainment company rather than saying, you know, I talked, with this person who was struggling with a similar issue about that, rather than saying, well, here's the six steps you need to overcome you know, your development areas. Um, someone earlier said about building the rapport. Once you have that rapport, then you can talk to them about the, the six steps. So, I mean, those are the things that that I really, you know, in listening to everyone, it's I think it's a common theme of, you know, building that rapport, um, really listening carefully to, what it is are the needs that are unsaid from people? Yeah. What are the impacts organizationally? Because let's say if you're doing a an executive coaching or a personal coaching, if you don't get in there and understand what is the culture, what are the the different components that are um, driving the various the the levers within the organization, really not going to be doing anyone any services and and the person is not going to be successful or the company's um, project 
that you're helping them with is not going to be successful um, because there's, you know, you have to understand the shape, uh, the stakeholders. So those are some of the things, you know, from, from a standpoint that, that I've learned over these many years about uh, there's a reason that entertainment is and always will be so popular because stories stick, right? It, it, you know, Ed, earlier you were talking about, ooh, and that fish we had. I mean, that's that makes that whole piece memorable to you, the time you met together, it lasts years for you, and then it'll last for us, listening about, oh, oh what about that fish? Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it really comes down to um, supporting clients by uh, you know, through storytelling, really. Thank you. Okay, Joanna, so please correct me on how I should pronounce your name. Well, I think you do it very good. <laughs> oh, you're so, you're so sweet. I, I really I mean, enjoy it's, knowing it's you. Johanna. It's Johanna in Swedish, but I mean, Johanna. Johanna. Okay, I, I promise I won't butcher it anymore, I'll tell you. <laughs> so this is your second time on our program. Uh, yeah. And so you I, I, you fit right in, that's for sure. And and I welcome you to tell another story now as we come to a close here. Another story? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So now you mentioned to me that um, in Sweden, um, you live in, in, you know, people live in seasons and the yeah. summer season is on us and, yeah. ev and everyone's running around really fast and quick and goal oriented because the summer is not going to last too long. Right. Yes. We, we talked about that, Ed. Yes. And I think it was actually when you said, Oh, you can invite someone else. And I think, you know, that invite was meant to be for the same day or the day after, and this is June. And I'm like, no, 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 no. We are way too busy. We, we schedule our agendas like weeks ahead of time, this time of the year. Um, so we do live in seasons and that is because the winter is so dark and so long up here. Um, it's even worse than Seattle. <laughs> so, um, when summer finally comes, uh, or spring, I would say, um, it's not only, you know, the business, your business, your work that, that you have to schedule in, you also have to schedule in all your socials and all your children's get togethers. Uh, school is out, um, everything is, is out. And something else that we have uh, that is quite unique is that it, it's an employment law actually that you need to give your employees four consecutive weeks off during June, July and August. So for three months, all your employees are gonna be gone at least for four weeks but people with small kids they also have parental leave we have a lot we have a long parental leave in this country um, so they like to combine the four weeks of vacation with four weeks of parental leave so that gives you eight weeks in the summer that you know your employee is going to be away so that's why I said we live in seasons because everything is concentrated about summer and summer getaways and get togethers and then you know fall comes and we want to be at home and then it's the winter and it's all about going skiing and planning the skiing and so so yes it's very seasonal actually fascinating i look forward to being in malmo and uh, so we're going to visit joanne's family uh, which is uh, in copenhagen right across the bridge mm -hmm. Um, from uh, Copenhagen is Malmo, um, and Stockholm is what four or five hundred miles north. Six hundred. Six hundred. Yeah. Well, kilometers. So yeah, yeah. miles. That would be yeah, probably right. Yeah, five hundred. Yeah. So it's probably not um, um, to be expected that we're going to have people travel from Stockholm and Oslo down into Malmo for this. September 26th event, they will, if interested, they'll be virtual. 
probably most likely. Yeah, so I, I should expect that. So that means our our reach will be focused on Malmo and, and Copenhagen and hmm. whoever else wants to show up. Um, but uh, okay, well, that's really smart marketing advice and I'll uh, study up on that. Thank you all for being on this program. Ray, uh, Ali, you want to? Speak? Yeah, just just really quick. Uh, I I love the stories. I also the the uh, 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 the story also that jo Joseph uh, mentioned. It reminded me of uh, Stephen's book um, in one of the chapters, creating a culture of uh, humaning. Um, I just wanted to share something that I feel like the most effective to change a culture in an organization, the higher you go up in the organization, the better, because those are the folks that are at the top that count to really create, help create the culture, help modify the culture. So, but it seems like a lot of times we're, we're being eff efficient and not effective. we look after the numbers after reaching the bottom line and we forget the human aspect of it. Just to illustrate how it is, how much we learn from from children my you mentioned about my son i want to share a story that that really taught me it's not important to uh, just be just look at the numbers and counting and look at the quantitative it's so important to look at the qualitative part of our lives he used when he was a, when he was a child he used to count things we'll be in the car and he says i saw five red cars uh, he will go upstairs the, up the steps he will he'll count he will say i'm in the kitchen uh, I want to, he will say, dad, I'm in the kitchen. I'm going to go to the run to the garage and then I'm going to come back. We're going to count and see how fast I am. So he was just so, so fascinated by counting. And one day we went down to the beach. We live here very close uh, to the beach. And, and, and Anthony used to re, uh, count the waves. He said, I saw five big, huge waves that came. And I looked at him one day and I said, Anthony, I noticed you don't, you don't share numbers. And he said something that made me stop and like, whoa. He said, why do I need to count the waves when I can enjoy the ocean? And I'm like, whoa, I gotta write this down. This is gonna be my best <laughs> book. So a lot of times we look at the bottom line, we look about the awards, we look about the things, but how much really we connect with people, how much we show that we care, not necessarily that we know. And that that's really that would be the bottom line. It's too bad that we start our lives from the beginning till the end. We don't live all our lives. We gain that wisdom and that knowledge and how important it is to connect with people. And then we go back and we say, you know what? That's what's important. That box of thank yous, of kudos that I've collected throughout my 30, 40 years of career, that's what's going to matter the most. So I want to thank you for that. I just wanted to end this with a thank you for the opportunity I met before meeting all the leaders and I've learned so much and I knew that when I walk away, I'm going to walk away with so many things that, that I'm, I'm writing down. If you notice, I was just writing things down. So thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you for being uh, on the show and thank you for uh, writing the book with Stephen. That's great. Yes. It's, it's, it's dedicated to you because you're the one who caused that to happen. So thank you. <laughs> Mr. Networking. So, um, the, the concept here is uh, let's do this program again. Um, probably better to do it after the 4th of July. Uh, and I'm, I'm going to New York. Um, I'm producing an in-person meeting with a guy who's coming in from England and we're meeting in Manhattan <laughs> on June 20. And uh, he is, uh, he works for a Swiss company called ITX. Uh, which is a bunch of bankers and lawyers, and uh, and that they're based in Geneva, but this guy's uh, in England, uh, and he's an expert on what's called GEC, the Global Employment Company format, and he deals with a very large organizations, multinational companies, and uh, who have a need to employ talent across borders. So there's legal issues, not to mention money issues, and not to mention cross-cultural issues. So what's the best way to manage that kind of distributed workforce? And so the Global Employment Company, or GEC, G -E -C, is a legal, uh, very expensive way to, to do that, but it's actually more efficient 
than the other ways of doing it. And so the New York event is an outgrowth of the London meeting that we just produced April 23 that Heather was a speaker at as well at HSBC in their headquarters. And also in that meeting was our speaker, Simon, who is the guy coming over to speak at my New York meeting on June 20, all about global employment companies. That event will be in a workshop on uh, 6th Avenue, just in the shadow of the Empire State Building. And uh, our host is uh, NYC Navigator, which has been a long time uh, client of mine. And uh, this is the second time NYC Navigator is hosting my New York meeting. They just hosted me on March 13 this year. And so this one's coming up June 20. And we're going to have uh, corporate executives from companies who are in, in Manhattan area uh, and some lawyers, some tax people, and some mobility people will be in the room. It'll be a small group. Um, I'm ordering sandwiches and salad in from Whole Foods, which is just down the street. And the education portion of that event, June 20, will be virtual. And so I want to uh, let you know, I'll be sending around the information this afternoon uh, to all of you. Uh, so have a look and uh, let me know whether you want to uh, be involved on the program virtually or unless you want to fly into Manhattan. Uh, I myself am doing a 72 hour road trip <laughs> from San Diego to Manhattan and back because the next day, at 9 a.m., Joanne and I are driving out to Palm Desert for a few days. And uh, so uh, that means I'm arriving in Manhattan uh, late on the 18th and departing uh, at 4.30 p.m. New York time to come back to California and then getting up and then going <laughs> on a road trip. <laughs> so busy, busy. So Christian, I wish you well on in your pursuit. Uh, I, you. I want to um, sincerely, uh, here we are doing this public, but I, I sincerely urge you to uh, be aggressive uh, in a cordial way. I'm sure you will do that with Alex. Mm -hmm. This is a, a really excellent contact for you. Uh, you know, Thank considering you your your me. your mutual backgrounds and his apparent need for mm -hmm. some help in that regard, um, he's not a mobility guy. He's a he's a immigration guy, right? Uh, and a lawyer. Uh, so there's plenty there's plenty of mobility people in Berlin and Frankfurt and elsewhere, but you have I think a leg up on this one. Thank you very much. So you, you you really should uh, be aggressive there. Will do. Okay. And if you need me to uh, be a connector again, um, it's easy for me to do that. I like doing it. Thank you. I you appreciate bet. that very much. Thank, Thank you, you all. Uh, it's breakfast time for me here in San Diego. <laughs> and uh, I, I wish you well. And uh, I'll be in touch. Thank you for sharing your stories. Uh, it makes for good TV. I'm sure you'll get some benefit from this. Thank, thank you all. Thank you. Thank you all. Thanks, very much. everybody. Thanks, everybody. Thank nice to see you thank all. You. Bye. 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 Thanks, Ed. Thank you, Ed. Yeah. This, this is great. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.